Okay, let's start. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> so last year, as I think everybody will remember, uh, the New Hampshire House had a memorable series of discussions about a bill that would have legalized and regulated marijuana, and similarly the way we treat alcohol. Uh, that bill was clearly a little bit ahead of its time. In 2015, we instead hoped to focus the legislature's attention on a bill we believe is long overdue, and that's House Bill 618. This is a bill that would simply decriminalize possession of an ounce or less of marijuana and reduce maximum penalties for other marijuana offenses. As you can see here on the map, all five other New England states have decriminalized marijuana possession. We believe 2015 should be the year that New Hampshire finally brings its penalties more nearly in the line with public opinion, with the New Hampshire Constitution, and with the penalties found in other New England states. One objection advocates have heard over the years is that decriminalization sends a wrong message to children. I'm hopeful that, that, that this year, the fact that the American Academy of Pediatrics has endorsed decriminalization will help dispel that particular objection. In case you missed it, their recent statement was, the American Academy of Pediatrics strongly supports the decriminalization of marijuana use for both minors and young adults and encourages pediatricians to advocate for laws that prevent harsh criminal penalties for possession or use of marijuana. Instead of criminal penalties, AAP supports an emphasis on treatment for adolescents who develop marijuana dependency. Another set of objections has come from members of the law enforcement community and particularly the Association of Chiefs of Police. However, it would not be accurate to broadly state that law enforcement is opposed to this bill. When a New Hampshire police chief ran for Senate in 2014, he publicly endorsed decriminalization, calling it, quote, a pragmatic answer to injustice. Another retired police sergeant was unable to make it today, but he's submitting written testimony, and I've provided both of those for you. Since 2008, the New Hampshire House has passed five bills that would have decriminalized possession. Last year's bill, HB 1625, passed the House 215 to 92, after being approved by the House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee in a 12 to 5 vote. Sadly, it was denied consideration by the Senate, which cited a technicality in its rules and did not grant the bill a hearing. This year, we believe the Senate will be more inclined to listen, and we know there will be no technicalities that prevent a House-approved decrim bill from being considered. First things first, today we're focused on making our case for HB 618 at today's hearing in the House Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. Uh, the committee did approve a bill 12 to 5 last year, but there are several new members of that committee, and our objective today is to earn their support at this hearing. And now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the prime sponsor of House Bill 618, Representative Adam Schrader. Oh, thank you. There are many reasons I'm proud to serve as the prime sponsor of House Bill 618, but I think the best argument is one that comes straight out of our New Hampshire Constitution. Part 1, Article 18 says, all penalties ought to be proportioned to the nature of the offense. In other words, the punishment ought to fit the crime. Currently, the penalty for possessing an ounce or less of marijuana is a Class A misdemeanor, punishable by up to a year in jail or a fine of up to $2,000. All five other New England states have determined that harsh criminal penalties are not appropriate for simple possession of marijuana. I believe we in New Hampshire should follow our neighbor's lead on this issue, so that the limited resources available to our criminal justice system can be directed toward things that Granite Staters are truly concerned about. Violent crime, property crime, and other serious threats to public safety. If my colleagues and I ask the people who voted us into office what they think about marijuana policy, the answer is clear. They support not only decriminalization, but outright legalization. The most recent Granite State poll conducted by the University of New Hampshire Survey Center found 59% support for legalization, with only 35% opposed. But this bill does not legalize marijuana, and it's very important that we all understand that. House Bill 618 simply reduces the penalty for possession of one ounce or less of marijuana, or five grams or less of hashish, to a violation punishable, punishable by a fine of $100. It also reduces maximum penalties for other marijuana offenses. Support for decriminalization is even stronger. With the Granite State poll finding that only 24% of New Hampshire residents are opposed to decriminalization. We have a real opportunity here to move New Hampshire forward by passing House Bill 618. 
and I think Granite Staters are more than ready to see it happen. Thank you. Our next speaker is a co-sponsor of the bill, Representative Joe Lachance. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. My name is Joseph Lachance. I represent Hillsborough 8, Manchester Ward 1. I also uh, bring a unique perspective to this uh, bill. As a co-sponsor, um, I've been a law enforcement officer in New Hampshire for almost 10 years. Um, House Bill 618 makes the possession still illegal. This is not a legalization bill. But in New Hampshire, in 2010, we arrested some 3,000 individuals annually for minor personal marijuana possession. New Hampshire is the only New England state that imposes criminal penalties like this for marijuana offenders for personal use. Enacting 618 will save New Hampshire taxpayers money and allow police and the courts to reprioritize their resources towards addressing criminal activity and not minor marijuana activity. House Bill 618 is a fiscally sensible proposal that will enable police, prosecutors, and our courts to reallocate their existing resources towards activities which will ultimately better serve the public and make New Hampshire a better state. Thank you. Next, we'd like to hear from Attorney Paul Toomey. Thank you. My name is Paul Toomey. I'm the former House Legal Counsel for the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Prior to that, I spent 35 years as a criminal defense lawyer, starting with Wisconsin Indian Legal Services, and then we started up with the New Hampshire Public Defender Program when it started in the late 70s. Um, I did that for about 10 years, and then after that, I was in private practice. During, during the course of all those years, came to the conclusion that we operate a two-tier system in regards to enforcement of marijuana laws. Um, in the absence of one or two factors, people aren't, don't face the pet criminal penalties of marijuana laws. If, if you've got enough money to hire a lawyer and you're not in one or two very small places where they sort of have aberrant behavior in the part of the courts, you're, you're not going to face any jail time. You're not going to have a criminal record at the end of it. You can plead it down to either a violation or some other offense. The people that pay those prices are the poor. Minorities, non-minorities, but basically if you go to a district court, when they, the people that walk in, if you want a lawyer, it's going to cost you at a minimum $1,000. Um, I asked another lawyer if I was overestimating the cost, and he said, no, you're way underestimating it. Um, and so people, people that are indigent can apply for a public defender, but in all cases, they're then going to have to pay it back. If they don't pay it back, they're going to lose their license. The convictions and, and the costs of it interfere with housing, they interfere with jobs, they interfere with being able to afford an education. They're all things that we want to enable and encourage our young people to do. And having a two-tier system where the poorest and the most challenged people pay a penalty that the better off is just simply unacceptable on this day and time. But we all pay a price. We, the uh, Civil Liberties Union in New Hampshire last year issued a report that estimated that we spent $6.5 million on enforcement, law enforcement costs um, for marijuana laws, for keeping it a criminal offense as opposed to decriminalizing. I think that number is, is a low ball number also. Um, we pay for every time a police officer has to arrest somebody for marijuana because it's a criminal offense. He has to take the time to take them to the station. He has to go through a booking procedure. He has to sit there and wait for a bondsman to come. He, he has to then write a report. Um, and then a prosecutor has to deal with the case and a judge has to sit on the case. In virtually all cases, if marijuana were decriminalized, these costs would go somewhere else. Like six five, six point five million dollars could be used for any other needs of the towns. The police officers' hours spent transporting people, booking them, waiting for the bail person, going to court, those could be hours that they spend on the streets protecting people. Um, for all those reasons, I think we, we need to create one system of justice where everybody is treated fairly. And if we're not going to impose criminal sanctions on people with threat of putting somebody in a cage for a year. If society has decided that's too big a sanction, whether they should just get rid of it. Um, finally, I'd like to point out that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration last week came out with a meta-study of all 
previously done studies, and they came to the conclusion, and I'll quote from it, I'll quote from it if I can find it, that there is no statistically significant change in the risk of a crash associated with the use of marijuana prior to driving. That's no as in zero. This is a chart, I don't know if you can see it, of various substances that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration study showed. This is marijuana. This is the, the baseline is the risk associated with a sober person driving a car that they're going to be in an accident. This is what marijuana risk is. It's exactly the same. This is alcohol at 0.05, which is a legal, not intoxicated under New Hampshire law's level. That is seven times, makes you seven times as likely to get in an accident. So we, we can save all the costs, both to the individuals, to the society, without creating a greater risk to our people on the roads. Thank you. And finally, we'd like to hear from another local attorney, Jonathan Cohen. My name is uh, Jonathan Cohen, and um, I'm a practicing criminal defense lawyer. My office is based here in Concord, but I travel to courts all throughout the state. And what I have seen is that there is an incredible disproportionality that can be corrected by this bill. <clears throat> there is a disproportionality in the way that a minor who is accused, say, of possessing alcohol and accused of possessing marijuana is treated. There is a disproportionality in the laws. If you are a minor and you're accused of possessing alcohol, you are facing a violation level offense. It is not a crime. It will not impact your ability to receive federal financial aid for school. It will not result in you being labeled a criminal, in you having to disclose this on your applications for college, for graduate school, for employment. If you are accused of possessing marijuana, this can be charged as a Class A or Class B misdemeanor. These are crimes under the New Hampshire Code. And if, as often is the case, you are accused of a Class B misdemeanor, you do not have a right to a court-appointed lawyer. You will face this yourself. I have had too many parents of children who are good students, who are good members of this community or of their communities, that are shaking in their boots because they got arrested and charged with possession of marijuana as opposed to alcohol. They are looking at the loss of federal financial aid. They are looking at the loss of their license. They are looking at being labeled a criminal. And they don't have an attorney with them to counsel them in many of these cases. They go in and they're scared and they plead and they take these consequences without understanding the full import of what that conviction will have. So this is an issue of proportionality. This bill will help to bring this in line with the way that alcohol is treated in this state. I have not been in a court yet where the clerk is not overworked and the judges are not talking about their heavy dockets. This will help to dramatically decrease the pressure that is being put on our district courts throughout the state and the pressure that is being put on law enforcement to go out and make arrests based on something that should be treated as a non-criminal offense. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Daryl Perry, Free Press Publications. So I'm reading the bill, and it seems as though there are two sets of penalties, or actually three sets of penalties. Uh, one penalty for anyone under the age of 18, one penalty for anyone between 18 to 21, and then a third penalty for anyone over the age of 21. Am I reading this correctly? I believe you are. Uh, in the committee last year, there was a lot of discussion about how under 21 should be treated, and it was the will of the committee that marijuana offenses for persons under 21 should be treated as identically as possible to the way we treat alcohol. So some of us have mixed feelings about some of those provisions, but they're in the bill. It's not letting 16-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds off with a $100 fine. It is requiring that they complete a drug awareness program, that they comply with the community service requirement if ordered by a judge, 
And that was the will of the committee last year. We, we certainly think that's an important part of the bill if we want to get it passed. And please tell me, just to follow up, if I may, uh, please tell me if I'm reading this correctly, that someone between the age of 18 to 21 gets a harsher penalty than someone under the age of 18? Uh, well, a person under 18 is also under 21. So the section for under 18 would also apply to somebody. Uh, well, I think you understand what I mean. Yes. The loss of a driver's license is, could apply to anybody 21. Anybody else? I'll throw another question out. Uh, any ideas on how many people that get the fine will then take the fine to court and appeal that? And what sort of, uh, I guess, evidence would be required to convict them if they did go to court? My understanding from states that have passed similar policies is that people usually don't have any interest in contesting them. They'll, they'll pay the $100 fine and move on. If they want to contest it, there is a procedure for doing so. Um, the result in other states, and in particularly Vermont, we can talk about because there's a lot of data and the Rand Corporation just came out with a detailed report. The real effect of this policy in Vermont, it was implemented in July of 2013. They've had 80% fewer criminal cases dealing with marijuana in Vermont. One thing that happened that was a little surprising to some people is there was actually an increase of 20% in the total number of cases, criminal plus civil. So police officers are actually writing more tickets after decrim than they were making arrests before decrim. And one of the things that the, the Rand Corporation said about that is that when police have their only option is to arrest somebody or let them go, you know, they, they often will just let them go. But if all they have to do is write somebody a ticket that isn't going to ruin their life, isn't going to keep them from getting a job or an education, they're more inclined to write the ticket. So they, they refer to that as a quote unquote net widening effect. And, uh, you know, it's, I think that's what happened in Massachusetts as well. And there's a good bit of data that suggests that's what would happen here. Yes, Emily. Can you talk more about why you think this time around the Senate will be amenable to this bill? Well, last year we didn't get to talk to him about it at all, so I was a little bit confident last year. Uh, you know, we've, we've been talking to senators for the last several years, and some of them privately think it's a good idea. And it's, it's been an ongoing attempt to, to educate the members of the Senate, and you know, I think a number of them are, are, are ready to have this discussion. I think they know that people are ready for this discussion. So part of it's the fact that all five other New England states have decriminalized. Part of it's the fact that four states have legalized. Maybe reducing penalties doesn't seem like that, that crazy of an idea anymore, <laughs> which it never was, of course. <laughs> Anybody else? Daryl. Yeah, so the way they do the measurements for ounces or grams, I know in some states if you have a cookie or a brownie that has either cannabis oil or hash oil, they will weigh the entire brownie and consider the entire thing to be cannabis to where you go over some arbitrary threshold. Uh, is that addressed at all in the bill as far as how to measure the uh, amount of either cannabis or hash and edibles. I don't believe it is addressed very specifically in the bill. My advice to anybody, first of all, everything's still illegal, right? It's still illegal to have marijuana, it's illegal to have brownies, but there would be a big jump if you get above the, the one ounce threshold. So my advice to anybody contemplating that would be to be careful, use, use your brain and, you know, be aware of what the law is. Right now it's all a crime. I think we're done. Thank you all so much for coming. The hearing is at 2.30 in, in the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, room 204. And if you're with the media, we do have handouts. Uh, if you didn't get one, let me know.